Good evening. Thanks so much for tuning in to tonight's Wednesday Night Worship video. Uh, as we've been doing over the past few weeks, we're going to be carrying on looking at the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, I'll offer a few thoughts in this video on our next passage, and then there'll be the opportunity to chat together and pray together over Zoom at 8.30. So tonight's passage, uh, we're moving on into chapter 5 now. We're looking at chapter 5, verse 8, through to the end of chapter 6, chapter 6, verse 12. So let me read that for us, and then we'll look at it together. So starting to read from Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verse 8. If you see the poor oppressed in a district, and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are and over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is vapour. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a labourer is sweet whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. I've seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands." This too is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for the wind? All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction and anger. This is what I have observed to be good. That it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labour under the sun during the few days of life God has given them. For this is their lot. Moreover, when give, God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and to be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God get, keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. I've seen another evil under the sun and it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some people wealth, possessions and honour so that they lack nothing their hearts desire. But God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them, and strangers enjoy them instead. This is vapour, a grievous evil. A man may have a hundred children and live many years, yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. It comes without meaning, it departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does that man. Even if he lives a thousand years twice over but fails to enjoy his prosperity, do not all go to the same place? Everyone's toil is for their mouth, yet their appetite is never satisfied. What advantage have the wise over the fools? What do the poor gain by knowing how to con conduct themselves before others? Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Whatever exists has already been named, and what humanity is has been known. No one can contend with someone who is stronger. The more the words, the less the meaning, and how does that profit anyone? For who knows what is good for a person in life during the few and vaporous days they pass through like a shadow? Who can tell them what will happen under the sun after they are gone? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a, um, a, an old uh, United States Navy legend. Uh, it tells of a, a, a story, whether or not it's true is sort of debated, uh, a story of a radio conversation between a US naval ship and the Canadian authorities. And this is how the story goes. 
Radio communication comes in from the US Navy ship. Please divert your course 0.5 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. The Canadian reply comes. Recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. The US ship replies. This is the captain of a US Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. The Canadian reply. No, I say again, you divert your course. The US ship. This is the aircraft carrier USS Coral Sea. We are a large warship, warship of the US Navy. Divert your course now. Canadian reply. This is a lighthouse. Your call. Sometimes we need a reality check, like that USS uh, Navy ship needed a reality check. We need someone to tell us, adjust your course when we're hurtling into danger. And this passage that we just read from Ecclesiastes, I think, is something of that reality check. It's telling us to adjust our course. And it's a reality check about money, about wealth. It's telling us to get real about money. Not long ago, in 2008, we had the global economic crisis. The British Medical Journal recorded that male suicide rate increased by 3.3% in the wake of the economic crisis. The British Journal of Psychiatry said that 10,000 suicides were associated with the economic crisis. Now, of course, we need to be careful about how we interpret figures like that and how we attribute causation, but surely those figures show that somewhere our view of money, our view of wealth and economics is out of whack. And this is a really important issue because the, the, one of the consequences of coronavirus is surely going to be uh, economic. There are going to be economic and financial implications for individuals, for our communities, for our community in light of coronavirus. And so we need to make sure that we have got real about money and finances and possessions and wealth to avoid the kind of tragic consequences that we saw in 2008. And as I said... This passage from Ecclesiastes, I think, is wanting us to give us that reality check. It's wanting us to get real about money and to find true satisfaction. That's what we're going to think about tonight. Get real about money and find true satisfaction. And that passage that I just read, a bit of a long passage, I know, it's kind of structured a little bit like a sandwich. We've got two big, great doorstops of bread sandwiched either side and a very skimpy filling right in the middle and the two big doorstops of bread talk about the same thing they they mirror each other and then the skimpy filling i think we find the answer as to how we're supposed to understand and interpret the whole passage so let's think about the bread first of all the bread of the sandwich the bread is telling us Get real about money. Have a look at chapter 5, verse 16. It tells us, This too is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for the wind? The teacher is telling us that pursuing wealth does not bring you gain. Remember, this has been his quest, hasn't it? He's looking under the sun. He's trying to find gain from life. We saw that in chapter 1, verse 3. And yet whatever he looks to under the sun to give him gain, he ends up with just thin air, with vapour. It's chapter 2, verse 11. He says, When I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was vapour, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun and here he's he, he's looking at wealth and he's saying this too is vapor 
This too doesn't bring gain. This too is asking more of reality than it's able to give if you want to find gain from your wealth, from your money, from stuff. Why does he say that? Well, first of all, he says that wealth and money doesn't satisfy. Chapter 5, verse 10. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is vapour. Or the other piece of bread on the other side of the sandwich. Chapter 6, verse 7. Everyone's toil is for their mouth, yet their appetite is never satisfied. Chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 9, better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is vapour, a chasing after the wind. He says, money, possessions, it doesn't satisfy. You can never have enough. It just leads to chapter 5, verse 11, hangers on, or not getting enough sleep, verse 12, because of indigestion. Rockefeller historically is one of the richest people ever to have lived. Um, people estimate that in today's terms he would have been worth about $340 billion. That's four times the wealth of the current richest person. And Rockefeller was once asked, how much money is enough money? And do you know what he answered? Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And that's what the teacher's saying. He's saying, look, no matter how much money you have, it's never going to be enough. It's never going to satisfy. This is something of the grievous evil that the teacher sees. That, that's what the, the term he keeps using. He looks around and says, I see a grievous evil. Money makes the world go round and yet it doesn't satisfy. He says he sees people who have had wealth but who have lost it and so can't enjoy it. Chapter 5, verse 14. He's seen people, wealth lost through some misfortune, so that nothing is left for their children to inherit. He's saying that you can't get gain from wealth, you can't take it with you, and even if you, you have it at one point, that the slightest thing can take it away. You lose your job, the market crashes, the investment goes south. If you're going to put your stock or your security in that, that's going to be a very fragile thing. Because it could be lost so easily. Or he says, even if you're able to keep on and hang on to this money, then it still doesn't satisfy. Chapter 5, verse 13, he says, I've seen wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners. He says that he's seen people with wealth, but, but they're... It harms them. They're not content with it. They can't enjoy it. Chapter 6, verse 1. He talks about how it weighs heavily on man mankind. Uh, that they have, they have so much wealth and nothing their, their heart um, desires. But they're not able to enjoy it. He talks about chapter 5, verse 17. People who who all their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction and anger. It's this idea that yes, they've got loads of wealth, they've got loads of stuff, they've got all the toys that you could ever want, but they don't have contentment, they're dissatisfied, they're, they're restless, they're frustrated, they're angry, they're, they're workaholics, they're warriors, all because of their wealth. He's talking about the tragedy of a life lived without contentment. That's the bread of our sandwich. He's saying, look, wealth, money, that doesn't give you gain. That doesn't satisfy. He's saying, get real about money and wealth. Well, now for the filling. What we find right in the middle shows us where we find true satisfaction. Because he goes on, chapter 5, verse 18, he's been looking around, he's saying, oh, I see this bad thing, I see that bad thing, I see this grievous evil, I see that grievous evil. But then he sees something good. Chapter 5, five verse 18. This is what I've observed to be good. 
that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labour under the sun during the few days of life God has given them. For this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives them someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and to be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. It's a real contrast. You see the filling? How the filling is a real contrast to the bread? He says that he sees something good. He sees something, verse 18, appropriate. Something fitting. Something that's actually being lived in harmony with the way life's supposed to work. He sees, verse 18, satisfaction. He sees, verse 19, the ability to enjoy. He sees, verse 19 again, people who are content with what they have. He sees, verse 20, what can only be described as the good life. Derek Kidner uh, summarises that verse in this way. He says, here we have a glimpse of the man for whom life passes swiftly, not because it is short and meaningless, but because by the grace of God, he finds it utterly absorbing. Isn't that the good life? Isn't that the life that we want? A life that, that passes quickly because we find it so utterly absorbing and satisfying and we are so content. That's what the teacher sees. And what is the secret? What marks this filling out from the bread what marks this good that he sees out from all the grievous evil and the bad things that he sees? Well, the thing to note is that this skimpy filling is packed full of God. God hasn't been mentioned in the bread. But here we see God spoken of much more. Wealth is recognised as a gift from God, verse 19. So you see, for the teacher, the problem isn't wealth or money per se. That's a good thing, if you have it. The problem is when that gift of wealth and money becomes more important to us than the giver. It's when we become lovers of money. We're back to this idea of idolatry again, where we turn a good thing, a good gift from God, into God itself. When we look to the gift to find gain and satisfaction, rather than looking to the giver. And so we've got a challenge here. Are we lovers of money? Are we people who are looking for satisfaction and ultimate worth from the gift that God gives us, rather than from the giver himself? Is it our finances that we look to for our significance? When we daydream and think, if only, do we daydream about wealth, possessions, having more? When we look at people in jealousy and envy, is it jealousy and envy over their wealth and their possessions? Now you might say, well, Andy, this isn't a problem for me. I'm a saver, not a spender, so I'm not a lover of money. But we can be lovers of money and not spend any of it. If it's that we find our comfort or our security or our sense of control over life in the, how healthy our bank balance is or how healthy our investment is. They're all symptoms of idolatry, I think. And they lead us to obeying our God money. Jesus said, you can't serve both God and money. You're going to hate one and love the other. We must serve something. But the teacher says that serving money, serving wealth, won't give us satisfaction. So the answer is for us to stop loving the gift and instead start loving the giver. The teacher said, stop, get real about money. Stop treating it as a God that can give you gain. And instead find true satisfaction. By enjoying the gifts God gives, yes, enjoy them. But enjoy them as gifts. Don't confuse them with the giver. 
Because it's only the giver, it's only God who can give us true gain, ultimate satisfaction, an inheritance that will not perish, spoil or fade. Get real about money and find true satisfaction. Let me close with some words from 1 Timothy, who I think sums up the message of this portion of Ecclesiastes so well. This is 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. He says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And so he goes on to say, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Get real about money and find true satisfaction.